I find myself in this sort of circle of three things in my life. When I speak to the Western Front Association, I'm told I'm not allowed to mention Gallipoli. <laughs> when I speak to the Gallipoli Association, I'm told I'm not allowed to mention Charlton Athletic. <laughs> and when I go to football, they say, don't mention the war. <laughs> uh, and we start again, we go around in a circle. So there we are. Um, I was, this is great subject that I've been given this time around uh, because it's something I'm quite passionate about. So I'm glad that the, what, uh, towards the last lecture of the day, we we're all going to do two hours on antennas and propagation, um, <laughs> or not, uh, because we're, we're lucky in that there is a wealth of anecdotal evidence about signalling in Gallipoli that when we put it together, it gives us an over idea of what it would have been like to be a signaller during the Gallipoli campaign, whether that's at Royal Engineers level or whether that's attached uh, to an individual uh, battalion. Uh, and the two mantras that are often trotted out uh, when you're on an army staff ride, much to the annoyance of the cut and thrusters of the infantry and gunners and the like, is, is just the two basic rules. You know, no logistics, there's no ballistics. And with no comms, there's no bombs. And so you underestimate those two elements of combat at your peril. You can be the most elite cat badge in the world. If your radios don't work, or if you haven't got supplies, it's going to end badly. And Gallipoli is no different for that. However, at Gallipoli, there are a number of inherent challenges uh, to the campaign in general. And we only have to look at this map, um, which is a contemporary wartime map, because it shows where the present British lines are. Uh, you know, with hindsight, I can tell the person who drew that map there, they're not actually going to go too much further. Um, but it's obviously before August because there's nothing on the Suvla element at the top there, you see. So what are those challenges? Well, obviously, there is the terrain. As a signaller, terrain's quite important. Lakes bounce things over where you want to be. Sand sucks things in. Valleys mean you can't speak to anyone, and if you can't speak to them, they can't see you either. Hills mean you can speak to everyone, but everyone can see you and they can shoot at you. So terrain and complex terrain, I think we'll all agree, any of you that have been to Gallipoli, this is very complex terrain. You yeah, so the terrain is very complex. As you can see at Gallipoli, it's going to give us all sorts of uh, problems communicating to who we need to communicate to. Add to that the operational complexity of Gallipoli in the fact that you've got ship to shore to sky, Brits, Australians, French, Russians, Indians, Welsh. I mean, it's going to get pretty complex, yeah? Um, so there's a lot going on, operational complexity, and, and just the nature of the Gallipoli operation as an expeditionary operation means that communications is always going to be a bit of a problem. And of course, lastly, is logistics. You know, this is cutting-edge technology, some of the signalling gear we're going to have, some of it, as you'll see, is not. However, it needs to be resupplied. And, you know, the logistics is really the whole thing behind the Gallipoli campaign. In fact, we could have a whole presentation, couldn't we, about what ends the Gallipoli campaign. Is it really once that railway from Berlin through Baghdad to Constantinople or down to Constantinople is open? Once the Ottomans and the Turks are able to get anything they want from Germany, the Royal Naval is effectively redundant and that's the end of the campaign. It's logistics at every single turn, isn't it? So we start off with ship to shore. Uh, now, this is as nearest as I could get to the Queen Elizabeth. I don't think it is there on the photograph. It's the Canopus. Yep, so very good. Um, but I wanted to give you the impression of when these are firing broadsides. And then as a signaller, I can imagine raising my eyes as Ian Hamilton signals, where he says, got a good spot for us today. We're going to see everything. Because Ian Hamilton himself suggested my station is up in the Conan Tower with de Robeck. The Conan Tower is a circular metal chamber, like a big cooking pot. Here we are, all eyes, like potatoes, in the cooking pot, aforesaid, trying to peep through a slit where the lid is raised a few inches, ad hoc, as those blasted politicians like to say. My staff are not with me in this Holy of Holies, but are so stowed away in steel towers or jammed into six-inch batteries. Now, this is the first problem, because the sensitive equipment they had at the time, this is not cutting edge communications we know now, these are basically wooden boxes and things. 
as soon as this thing fires, it breaks it all, it unsettles it all. So the very first salvo, we lose any form of wireless communication that we're going to have uh, with the shore. Goes on to say, Roger Keyes started the notion that um, certain troops should be diverted to Y Beach, where they could land unopposed, and whence they might be able to help their advance guard uh, at V more effective than by direct forcements if they threatened to cut the Turkish line of retreat from saddle Albier. Now, we know all this because we know that what was happening at Y Beach was potential glimpse of a breakthrough in that it was initially unopposed as they land there. Um, however, Hamilton's not so keen to impress this onto his staff. He says Braithwaite was rather dubious uh, and uh, he felt it was best to not barge into Hunter Weston's plans for GHQ, uh, who, where the real communications was going on at the time. Um, but to me, the idea of reinforcing Y Beach seemed common sense even if it did not suit Hunter Wester, Hunter Weston. All I have to say is that Hunter Weston was in closer touch with all of these landings than we were, and it was not for me to force his hands. There was no question of that. So at 9.15, I issued the following wireless. So we know that at 9.15, he's got comms up, and he's able to speak to group troops on the ground. And effectively says, GOC to GOC Euralius, would you like to get some men ashore? And why beach? If so, I've got trawlers available for you. There's no reply for 45 minutes. Nothing. And nothing's happening at Saddle Bear, at V Beach. Really, we can see the thing unfurling in front of us. Uh, so he decides to send a second message, this time being a little bit more personal in it, where he says, General Hamilton to General Hunter Weston on Euralis, do you want more landed at Y? The trawlers are, av trawlers are available, please acknowledge this signal. And it was another hour until the answer came back saying, uh, I've spoken to the Navy and Admiral Weems, and they state that to interfere with the present arrangements and try and land men at Y Beach would actually delay disembarkation. So we use, see their evidence of wireless being used to try and say, can we do something at Y Beach? And I've often stood there as a guide thinking, why didn't Hamilton interfere here if he knew what's happening? I don't know all the answers. What I do know is we're very lucky today because these brought along are signalling flags uh, that were marked up Gallipoli, 1915, King's Own Scottish Borderers. There's every chance that these would have been fiercely from the top of Y Beach trying to communicate with someone to say, can I have some help, please? I mean, it's incredible, isn't it, these old veterans? Um, but you can also see, without me attending you Morse, if I'm stood on top of a hill doing this, I'm pretty visible, aren't I? And we'll come to that in a little bit later. So a couple of real Gallipoli veterans, and I'll, I can't thank you enough for bringing them along, really. I'm not sure you're going to get them back, but, you know, <laughs> I am South London after all. Um, uh, now, there are other uh, uh, signalers also um, involved, and one of those is uh, Sam Sutcliffe. And uh, Sam Sutcliffe, um, during the evening, uh, he's in the Essex Regiment, uh, in June 1915, is attached to the Royal Navy to do communications. And he's very worried about it. Naval signalers are quite good. They're pretty fast as well. The embarrassment as an army signaler, when you receive a message from the Navy, which uh, in Z and Q codes, which is what we all operate in, says fetch a competent operator onto this means, is very embarrassing when you hear that coming to you. Not that I did, but I know people who did. Uh, and Sam Sutcliffe, back in 1915, says the same thing. During the evening, a nearby ship signalled an invitation to our captain to visit. Later, we received a longer message, completely in cipher. One could not even tell to whom it had come from and to whom it was to go to. I was so nervous, I got the sender to, com to um, reply every, repeat every single detail because we feared the very slightest error would bring us down into bad trouble on our heads and disgrace our signal section. I found myself trembling as I handed the completed message to the officer. It all seemed so much more important than any other job I'd previously done. No doubt, because I was working with a different service, the Navy, and I felt I had to do well and earn a good opinion. Dawn came, and I rejoined my lads, had some food, and I settled down for a long, good sleep. It shows the pressure that the infantry signalers felt when they were dealing with the Royal Navy. 
was their standard up to the standard of those guys that were so uh, busy uh, sending their messages. Now, was there a communication plan at all? Well, yes, there was. Uh, this is a general map you can see of the land in certainly around um, S Beach, B, W and X and Y just off the map there. Of course, most, for me, the most impressive one being implacable, the way the captain disagree, disobeys his orders and almost drifts in far and a broadside uh, to assist the men of board at X Beach. Um, there was a plan uh, because there was actually a pamphlet issued. There's not a lot of doctrine in the Gallipoli campaign, is there, if you've looked for it. Not a lot of instructional pamphlets available. Yet there was one called Signals Organisation for Combined Operations. And that's pretty much on the you know, money. That's exactly, Martin, when you said this combined ops earlier, you can see they, they got it there, acknowledging it. They're using the terminology in their pamphlets. And the idea of this plan was to link ships, aircraft and ground forces all by wireless on board HMS Queen Elizabeth. So she'd play a key role in everyone being able to speak to each other. Uh, it was a guy called William Cottrell. Uh, he was a commander, signals officer, that organised this entire system of communications between sea and land. Um, it also uh, involved the laying and repairing of all cables several times under fire. And as a result of this, uh, um, William Cottrell actually is awarded a DSO because he personally, even though he's commander, goes ashore and, and ensures that these cables from ship, you can hardly imagine it, ship across water onto land as the standbys are, are repaired throughout. Um, his oppo with him was uh, the yeoman of signals, a guy called Albert Arthur Bishop, and it says that uh, he was to be awarded the Conspicuous Gallantry Medal uh, for showing great devotion to duty in action during the Dardanelles operation. After his left leg had been shattered above the ankle, this man raised himself into a sitting position and continued performing his duties as a signaller and passing reports to his commanding officer. So some pretty brave actions there, just trying to get this communications going throughout the first day. We then moved to ground to air, which will make Carol very happy because that's a picture of the ship that you were going to show earlier, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's, a, it's quite an interesting ship, actually, isn't it? Because I think um, this is the, uh, the Manica, this one, HMS Manica, which is a balloon ship. It turned up in the city of London port carrying several tons of manure to be unloaded. And after they'd unloaded it, the Admiralty took over the ship and said, we're requisitioning this and converted it into a balloon ship. The balloon ship was going to be key for communications in the Gallipoli campaign. Actually spent most of the first day off the coast uh, of, of Anzac. Um, Ground to air communications were um, primarily done by number three squadron Royal Naval Air Service, uh, who, of course, in a few years' time, April 1st, 1918, would be given the choice to either join the Royal Air Force or revert back to their, their nautical duties. Uh, so that would be the link with the building we're in here. Um, they flew 26 missions themselves on the 25th of April. Uh, two of them, well they, well, they had like a cab rank system, which is the really earliest thing I've ever heard of it. Two seaplanes would be continually flying above the landings to give us reports back. So we talk about this as an uh, aviation sort of evolution later on, don't we? Having that air cover continually there. But on the 25th of uh, a, um, April, two seaplanes, it took 16 individual flights to ensure that there was always two up above trying to report back. Uh, there was a lot of provision made for communication from uh, the air down to the ground. And in fact, Ian Hamilton said that they could cut above anything else if they saw stuff that was important. They were to report it. So no matter who was talking on the radio or receiving and sending Morse code, if these guys in the air had a message, they took priority. Because I think everyone realised this. Probably after the 1912 field exercises in the UK, you know when Haig gets really badly defeated by Grierson and it's sorted with aircraft observing where the enemy are hiding. I think Hamilton probably had a bit of a grasp of how important aircraft were for observation in the early hours of a landing. Um, off of Anzac, where the ship was working, they actually sent an Australian um, wireless section from there and within an hour of the initial landings, there was a wireless station operating at Anzac, sending back mostly Morse code. Voice, 
would have been a bit dodgy at that time, so mostly in Morse code, sending it back. So we have got comms uh, very early on. However, with all things, there is a significant problem. Uh, now, I'm almost the right photograph. This is Hunter Western Hill on the right. You'll recognise it. It's looking over towards um, uh, Hill 134 and over towards X Beach. The bit I wanted was just behind me, but I didn't have a photograph of it. However, this is the significant problem. Only at work, if you've studied British military history, you'll, you'll relate to this. The problem was no training had taken place for integrated communications between aircraft and our own field artillery that were on the ground. But they thought it'd be a good idea if the aircraft could spot for the artillery. Makes common sense, doesn't it? Um, actually, it uh, was entirely ineffectual, and that was because observers, like the chap you see on the left here, Mr. Sampson, who was one of the pilots, spent all day ob observing fall of shot and tapping out corrections on his Morse key while he's trying to fly an aircraft, joystick between his leg, all right, and trying to watch things as well and look out for anyone that's shooting at him back. Uh, and he was absolutely furious that the artillery were completely refusing to respond to any of his signals. And it was after about an hour and a half of this that a naval ship started sending a message back to him saying, we don't think they can hear you. And he said, this is typical Lincoln Army, this is. You know, the Navy can hear me. Why can't you hear me? So they soon work out that actually the Army had been given different frequencies to the Navy. And so just not able to pick it up anyway. So they're all sat there looking at this aircraft saying, well, and the aircraft's going, blimey, why aren't you listening? And so the integration was in, 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 it was in an idea, it wasn't so great. So what was the solution? Well, one thing we can say about Gallipoli, I think, is continual initiative is shown by the people that are there. Uh, and Sampson and his uh, co, uh, second aircraft as co-pilot land in the emergency airfield. Steve, we're always looking to try and see who used that airfield. These guys use it in early May, land, run across to the battery positions, or in fact run into the uh, headquarters on top of Hunters of Westerns Hill, point to a map and say, that's where the Turkish battery is. At which point they say, ah, well we haven't got comms either, but never mind, what we'll do is we'll send up some rockets to correct. So we send up rockets which correct the fall of shot perfectly, and just as our artillery is about to respond, the sight of rockets means the Turks now are bombarding Hunter Western Hill, and all the Turkish gunners that we're aiming at say they must have seen us and move into cover. But it shows the initiative to actually land an aircraft, run across and point on a map. It's fairly, fairly basic stuff. So all in all, ground to air was not a great success. There is a good book on it I'd recommend by Hugh Dolan, talks about the air battle over Gallipoli and he talks about lots of the problems that we have with communication. So we should turn to what were the principal elements of signalling in the First World War and in the Gallipoli campaign. Well, the most important one of all, and the most common one of all, is wire. Any of us that are signals are proud of our little chip in our tooth there, which comes from hours of stripping Don 10 and dentists having a go at you when you're in your 50s because you haven't looked after your teeth. Um, one of the best examples of, of, of wire is actually Alec Riley. We've not got to evacuate, have we? Is that my 40 minutes up already, Steve? <laughs> um, Alec Riley, and I'm sure you've all read that book. It's one of the best Gallipoli books that's come out for a long, long while, uh, his diary. First East Lanx uh, Divisional Signal Company. And he talks about, and actually this is the anecdote I think, Carol, you mentioned briefly in this gully. He says, early in the morning of Wednesday, May the 12th, our line, was found, our, our line of wire was found to be no good at all. So Pearson, Dale and Whiffington came with us. From their tempers, they seemed to have enjoyed a rather bad night. It appeared so that they had followed the wrong wire from brigade and it all got, ended up mixed in a pile of mud. We went out to look at our wire of line. We followed it alongside of a shallow nullah until it ended up in open country near Criffia. Our nullah was about 350 yards long and we called it Dead Man's Gully. Snipers were very busy, so we took care of ourselves in the shallow parts and when we'd examined 200 yards of line, we decided we'd done our bit and done enough. Dead Man's Gully had been held by a battalion of the 29th Division and held with a certain amount of trouble. We found a few dead men with ground, steel sheets thrown with ground sheets thrown over them 
and we discovered one body so, so suddenly that the surprise was most unpleasant to all of us. In one place, we found it full of rifles, equipment, helmets, clothing, the contents of haversacks, forks, spoons, Bibles and prayer books, small personal possessions, and thousands of rounds of ammunition. It was a lonely and depressing place, and we had to get back to our trench, particularly as the passing bullets made us windy. So often when you're out there trying to repair a, liar, uh, a line or a wire, there are two things that can happen. Firstly, it just becomes impossible because you can't find the other end. Don 10, or the equivalent copper wire in First World War, was not intelligent to shell fire. It tends to break and break properly. The other thing, uh, which without trying to sound like a sketch from Blackadder, is that you can often find a piece of wire and you can connect up to it and that's when you pick up your headset and you can hear Colonel von Stormfengrime <laughs> asking for a table by the window in some Berlin cafe because their wire is the same as our wire. And in fact, you don't even need to connect the wires to listen into each other. So you can be within a metre or so of a ground spike and you can listen to what people are saying. So it's not a secure form of communication by any means. Perhaps the most famous uh, example, and there's Dead Man's Gully, by the way, if you've not been to that part, just by the back of Twelve Tree Cops, Fir Tree Wood, and that's where we're talking about where he would have been, one of the spurs off of Krafia Nuller that we spent many hours traipsing across over the years, Steve, haven't we? Some nice snakes in there as well, isn't there? Yeah, I, I was only two years ago that I learnt, you know, obviously being a Londoner, we deal with snakes all the time, right? <laughs> so I was assumed that scary stuff is bright coloured, and if it's black or brown, it's going to be all right, like a grass snake, uh, until uh, Adem corrected me when I saw one of these big brown snakes in the, in the Krafia Nulla, and uh, I went to ask him what it was, and he was running the other way. Uh, so I've learnt now, don't trust the brown snakes, they're quite bad, apparently. Here's the most famous signaller of all, really, in the Gallipoli Peninsula, uh, and a Gallipoli Association member, Steve, right? I think our only Victoria Cross hole, or the last surviving Victoria Cross that was a member. Um, this is uh, Cyril Royston Guyton Bassett, who was very popular, cigarette cards showed him in his action here. It was actually a couple of actions, people miss off the first one. Um, Bassett was actually on the 26th of April in charge of a section of five other signallers uh, when the New Zealanders first land at uh, Anzac and he's able to lay down and maintain telephone lines between brigade headquarters right up to uh, what would then have been Quinn's post. Now that was quite important because if we're honest about the Anzac uh, landings then the problems that I think they suffer are down to brigade headquarters uh, and uh, that just the interfit not going up to the front and seeing what's happening you know, just taking all of their information for people that are wounded coming off the battlefield back onto ships. Now, my time in the police would teach you that if you see someone running away from a bank, you don't stop them and say, hey, mate, what's happened? Right? In the same way, soldiers leaving a battlefield, limping down, you don't say, how many Turks? Because they're not going to say, to be honest, about half a dozen and we'll be all right. They're going to go, millions of them! <laughs> you know? Um, so we needed that wire, and he's able to get a, a, a decent comms up to the front line, and for the first time in the campaign, some 36 hours in, start to build a picture of what the front line was like up at uh, Anzac. Then, of course, later on in August, more famously, and that is complex terrain, isn't it? When we look around here, this is that hike up towards Chanak Bay, you can see in North Anzac, uh, one of the most fascinating areas of the whole of the peninsula, to my mind. Um, he was, uh, again, working on the exposed slopes of Chanak Bear, keeping the signals going to and fro. Uh, and um, it was for that gallantry, when he was armed just with a revolver and a bayonet, no rifle at this time. Um, in fact, a bullet did strike his boot, um, but passed through the hill, and uh, thankfully he wasn't wounded at all. Um, it was after the Chanak Bear incident that his name, along with the other five signalers in the section, uh, were collected by a chap called Major Arthur Templey in the brigade headquarters and they n had a sort of talk about it and that's when our man was uh, a sort of uh, warned that he might be receiving the Victoria Cross. Um, now before he actually found out about it he was evacuated from Gallipoli due to poor health and it's actually while he was in hospital in Leicester that he realised he'd been awarded the Victoria Cross. 
Um, he's a very interesting guy in that he was a bank manager before the war, took to Siglin, or a bank teller before the war. After the war, he went back to the same bank and worked for them between the wars and then became the head of New Zealand Siglin in the Second World War in the home sort of area and then went back to the bank. He was a very simple guy. Siglin banking seems to be his thing. The citation says that uh, conspicuous bravery and devotion to duty on Chanak Bear Ridge um, after the New Zealand Infantry Brigade had attacked and established itself on the ridge, Corporal Bassett, in full daylight and under a continuous and heavy fire, succeeded in laying telephone line from the old position to a new one on Chanak Bear. He was subsequently been brought to notice for further excellent and gallant work connected with the repair of telephone lines day and night under heavy fire. And his Victoria Cross was actually awarded to him uh, by King George V at Buckingham Palace in February 1916. He was later commissioned and served on the Western Front as an officer. Um, he remarked on the VC, I reckon there must be some guardian angel looking after me, especially as one man was shot dead right in front of me, another two wounded just behind. And perhaps the most famous thing, when he used to get interviewed a lot in later in life, I think he lived right until about 1982, 83, Steve, right? Um, he used to say he was the only New Zealander to be awarded a Victoria Cross in the Gallipoli campaign. And he said, I got a Victoria Cross and all my mates got wooden ones. That would be his constant quote that he'd say, you know. Visual signaling. What can we say about visual signaling? It's, well, you've seen it. I'm not going to demonstrate it again. It's a good example of a couple of people visual signaling. Um, when I first started employing guides, you know, the company got big enough that we employ guides, one of the things I could see is often you've got someone who has written a book on belt buckles of the first, fifth Oxenbucks like infantry at From Els, and they <laughs> want to be a guide. And that's great, it's wonderful. But then when you say to them, um, can you do something on the Australians? They're like, oh, what? they weren't in the Oxenbucks, right? I mean, it's generalization. There's lots of excellent guides out there. So one of the things I encouraged early on is any British guide to pick a battalion in the Australians, the South Africans, New Zealanders, Americans, French army, adopt them, become them, learn from them. And I just happened to be in Australia when a book came out called Silent Voices, which was the history of the 10th Battalion, the AIF, and it was a fantastic account. They're from Morfittville, they were a uh, you know, war-raised unit, they were all friendly and, and, and pals with each other. And one of the key guys in this was a fella called Sidney Hall. He was the main communications officer. He'd worked in telecom before the war. He trained all his men in Australia so that they were all capable of operating Morse code to a very high standard, talking like 20 words a minute, sending and receiving. Their discipline was absolutely superb, but he also said, you are soldiers and signalers. So they were as good a shot as anyone else in the battalion. Now we know that uh, on the Anzac landings, things don't go exactly to plan. And some are landed in the wrong, well, well, wrong play. We could have a debate about that. Anyway, they land around Ari Banu. And the 10th Battalion, who are amongst the first ashore, because remember at the time the Australians didn't want it to be either Victoria or New South Wales, because they would, you know, a bit of a needle between the two of them. So it was actually the other units, including the 10th AIF. They come ashore and they have to get up to Pluggies Plateau really early doors. The only problem is the rifle companies are coming in and the signal guys have all landed. So they now become the tip of the spear. Hall gets them cutoffs on their rifles, advancing the point of bayonet straight up the long way to Pluggies Plateau. Now, Baruch mentioned, the, Baruch mentioned how hard it is to walk up there today along the path. To scramble up that scrub before the new road was in would be quite an issue. Uh, and once they get to the top to Pluggies and they get a decent view and they see people landing in behind, they then realise, right, it's time to become a signaller. Now, even though Captain Hall had signallers with him, they were all engaged shooting enemy, trying to clear the scrub of any Turks that were around. So Captain Sidney Hall, and I'll just do a direct quote from it, was last seen on the small plateau at Pluggies, calmly waving a set of red and yellow flags whilst bullets sprayed the dirt about his feet. He was killed that afternoon halfway through a message, his men commentating that he was always destined to either win the VC or die in action. And that for me is a signaler to that point where he stood there, you know when you're waving away at a ship desperately, you've forgotten about your own safety. 
because you're not going to last long. And sure enough, Hall is buried uh, in Beach Cemetery. I encourage people to go and look at him because it's just another story and you know, it's the well-trodden path to go and see. Obviously, uh, since Fitzpatrick is important, but just behind him you'll find Captain Hull, a, Hull, a signaller, waving flags on top of Pluggy's Plateau. Now, another signaller in the old waving flags that we're lucky was a bit of an artist as well. This is Ellis Asilas of the 16th AIF. Aren't they wonderful sketches that he does? He does those whilst he's on the peninsula, and he annotates them, which is why I've put them here. The one on the left, he says, it was across this exposed spot that many times I had to run dispatches. The ridge on the right, where shrapnel can be seen burst in, was thick with snipers who had this small patch so well set that they rarely missed their mark. The poor chaps seen in the drawing all got caught trying to get across with messages. I wondered if I was about to join them. And then the one on the right-hand side, you says, he says here, snipers consider, uh, created a considerable amount of dust every time I got up to signal my flags. In fact, I think they had a real merry time. But being so sure of their mark, they became careless. Well, whatever the course, they didn't get me. The feet above, the, above me are those of a buried comrade. It was not an unusual occurrence when digging in to come into contact with a grave. That's really quite graphic when you read that, isn't it? So he's got to stand up there from that viewpoint. You can kind of see the terrain there. I think he'd be looking up towards, uh, sort of um, up onto the actual Anzac Ridge itself. And it's one of those little gullies that's not yet been cleared. And he's got a dead comrade alongside him. And then you've got to stand up every now and again and relay that message that's coming from the front line down to the beach. So Ellis Silas. We should move on to wireless. Because it sounds really impressive, doesn't it? But there's a problem with wireless. And the most portable set was a Marconi 150 kilowatt set that was on shortwave, which was still a wooden box about the size of this lectern. It certainly wasn't man portable, and it certainly wasn't any use at being used in the front line. The real problem with wireless communication was not wireless technology, but battery technology. The batteries to keep these things going meant that you couldn't move them anywhere. They were too big, too large, too cumbersome. So they're only really used at headquarters and on beaches. You can see the sort of stuff that's being used just in, on the right-hand side there. It's a very typical sort of dugout at Gallipoli with the biscuit boxes behind and what have you. And then this one on the left is actually taken in training before they go overseas, but an elementary mast up. And uh, the one thing you'll notice with those masts, if you are a signaler or aware of signaling, is that the secret of signaling is so that I can pass a message to you, Sarah, without you guys hearing it. I've got to get it through the middle, right? That's why we have those dipoles in signaling. In first world, world, world terms, and certainly at Gallipoli, our antennas are omnidirectional. So imagine like the start of the RKO films where it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Everyone can hear it. So that's a limitation on signaling anyway. It's not that secure. We've not yet developed the ability to throw it down a narrow angle. So that's a real problem is having the uh, um, omnidirectional antennas. Everyone can hear them. One of the worst tragedies to signals in the whole of the Gallipoli campaign actually occurs on the beach here. See the sort of kit that I'm talking about on a beach station and the limber working in the back, what have you. Now I would urge any of you, if you ever visit Lancashire Landed Cemetery, there's a little plot of lands along here that are all RE signalers. It's almost a forgotten story, but it's played out in, well, one of the best assets of us as an association is the uploading of the old Gallipolians on the website, right? It's just incredible, isn't it? And if you look through there and you can search, this story came to light maybe 2001, 2002 in the Gallipolian, and it talks about uh, the wireless station on W Beach taking a direct hit. We've actually got three accounts that we found. The first one is... Second Lieutenant Woodrow, GHQ signal section. He says, I regret to report that Signal's office was wrecked this morning at 12.30 by a shell, killing five and wounding four of our men. There are also several men unknown sheltering in the office doorway who were also killed or wounded. The following is the list of our casualties, and he goes on to name them all. I'd recently left our Signal's office and at the moment was outside my dugout, and seeing that the office had been struck, I immediately returned. Although only a few seconds had elapsed, I found that Corporal Walker had already commenced removing wounded and everything possible was being done for their comfort. 
Men were at once dispatched to the RMC for stretchers and the office was cleared quickly. Finding that our AC current was in circuit, I informed them what had occurred and I asked them to inform GHQ it was a very important imperative that undamaged instruments should be removed immediately. I issued instructions to lead a team from terminal pole to signals office, fix up the instruments and inform each office in turn what had happened. As each office came in, the circuit, which effectively calls signs on a net, a new lead was run round and uh, we got back up and running as circumstances admitted. In conclusion, I have to report that practically the whole of our men off duty under Sergeant Wright came to the signals office immediately after the explosion and rendered valuable assistance. Perfect order was maintained throughout. Corporal Walker acted with splendid presence of mind under such terrible circumstances. I think this is AJ Annie firing into W Beach that takes the signal section out. It does get mentioned by John Gilliam that you've all read his account, no doubt, Gallipoli Diary. He said, later in the morning, we got a few high explosive shells. One pitched clean on the roof of our signals office, which is of a timber direction, sandbagged, and proof against splinter only. There the clerks were, tap, 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 and buzz, 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 to anyone who listened to them all over the peninsula. Messages being sent and received every minute, almost day and night. It's like a central telegraph office in London. Down came the shrieking thing, a deafening report, splinters of timber, torn sandbags, dust, stones, and smoke flying to the air, and then silence. A pause, and men rush, not away, but towards the ruined office. Nine men and one signals officer have been killed. Several wounded are then carried up the cliff to the hospital. And we're lucky in that the medical officer who dealt with those casualties was also on the scene, a guy called Colonel Tubby. And in his memoir, he says, a shell fell into the signal office on W Beach, killed six officers and men, and wounded 13. It completely disorganised the working of the signals, yet in 39 minutes, our people had them up and running again. So from a shell landing, 39 minutes, we were resending messages. On this evening, we were operating on the casualties till midnight on the wounded of the 89th Field Ambulance on W Beach from the effects of this one single shell. So 39 minutes to get it back in again. It's quite incredible. So next time you're in Lancashire Landing, just dig these guys out. They're all in a little row there. Um, and they all say wireless operator on there. If you look on, online, so you can work out who they are. Of course, there's another form of signals messaging that we shouldn't forget. I mean, that's got to be one of the most incredible images of the Gallipoli campaign, isn't it? Have you all seen that one before or come across it? It's fantastic, isn't it? Well, I've got the account. It's Harry Chevelle. Um, or General Harry Chevelle, uh, describes this actual scene when this photograph was taken. It's between Suvla Bay and North Anzac. And it said, following the landing at Suvla in August 15, we found it necessary to organise dispatch rider services between headquarters at Suvla and headquarters at Anzac. The distance was six miles, and almost the whole of the route was exposed to rifle fire from Turkish trenches on the ridge overlooking it. The mail used to leave Suva in the morning and return from Anzac in the afternoon. It had to be done at the gallop, and the rider was fired at from the time he left the shelter at Lalababa until he reached the wide communication trench near Anzac. Yet all the light horsemen, mounted rifles, and yeomanry of the British were tumbling over each other to get the job. And fortunate indeed was considered the regiment which had to find men for this duty. The ride was one of the daily entertainments Everyone on the left of Anzac knew the moment the mail left Suva for the rattle of Turkish mus musketry which began on the extreme left and continued along the line until the rider was safely in the communication trench. Strangely enough, this went on for nearly three months before either a rider or his horse was hit. There was always heavy wagering whether the post would get through and it's probable that Johnny Turk was betting on this as well. <laughs> It's almost like, you know, the Wild West, isn't it? Galloping along. And look, I'd love to know exactly where that cemetery is. Somewhere there, just so close to the water, um, down towards Suvla Bay. The other side of this was obviously dispatch riders, like the guy you see here. This is quite a famous image of a dispatch rider operating uh, in a trench down towards Helles. Certainly there were quite a few dispatch units, uh, dispatch rider units, or dispatch riders operating, part of the Royal Engineers service section. Um, primarily they used like Douglas uh, 500s, Tusk Trusty Triumphs, 
Uh, their dress is very unique. You can see that wonderful headdress that they all wear. Well, they don't all wear, actually. There's only few that wear it. Now, I, I was intrigued by this because this guy here that you see whenever we talk about dispatch riding in Gallipoli, now, I can't see that riding that around trenches like that is much quicker than walking, if I'm honest. Um, but it probably sounds good and looks good, right? Um, that's probably the second most famous photograph of dispatch riders. The most famous one, of course, is this that you had all seen before, yeah? Only that we now know that's not Gallipoli. It's probably taken at Imbros before they land. And what I like about this, we'll come to it in a moment, is this is a classic example of a reverse POWs unit. And I'll come to what I mean in a moment. So here we can see there are various types of uh, guys wearing different headdress and what have you. They've all got their own sort of motorbikes. There's no such issue as such. I mean, you went to stores and got a central motorbike, but then you kitted it out how you wanted. So some prefer to have these like klaxon horns, some like the big headlights, whatever. They're all very different. You can see the different mountains. What intrigues me is this guy here, the bike, and that guy, I'm convinced, is the same man. I've looked at his face and his helmet and all his stuff and the way this is rigged up, and I reckon it's the same guy. Now, there was only one of these companies operating on the Glippin Peninsula, so it's very likely that that is our same man. Um, now, what did I mean by when I said uh, a, a reverse unit of a PALS? They were a Royal Engineers uh, Signals Company dispatch rider section. They'd all learnt to ride. But in 1919, almost entirely, this bunch of guys become the very first AA motorbike patrol service. So it's at the end of the war that they introduce motorcycle rever uh, patrols and they recruit from this company. So someone gets a job and says, come along, mate, I've got a job for you, and there we go. And certainly, you know, I'm a young and born in 68, but I can remember AA patrols on their motorbikes and their big white gloves, and this was the origins of it. Uh, so I always assumed that these were recruited from the AA, it's the other way around. They don't start till after the war, and these become the AA, which I think is a lovely little story. Next time you see that photograph and it says, dispatch riders at uh, W Beach, it's not. All right, it's taken at Imbros. Is that right, Steve? You reckon the same? And if you book next year's Gallipoli tour with the association, our, uh, we're going to go across to Imbros, aren't we? Should be great. Fingers crossed. Perhaps the most famous dispatch rider of them all is this fellow here. Uh, this is Charles Kingsford Smith. So any of you that have ever landed at Sydney Airport, that's who it's named after, Kingsford Smith International. Um, he was a dispatch rider throughout the Gallipoli campaign before he eventually transferred, bright lad signalers, into the uh, Royal Flying Corps. He's awarded a military cross uh, for balloon busting. Uh, and uh, he's eventually shot down and uh, evades capture. Um, and after the war, he becomes a, a barnstormer stump pilot. Um, but he's, the, he's part of the first ever Trans-Pacific flight in 1928. Uh, and uh, actually disappears in 1935, trying to attempt the record flight time between Australia and England, somewhere uh, just off the coast of Burma. He ditches in the sea. They did find wreckage of his aircraft a few months later, washed up, so they know that he didn't make it through. Um, but that's why the airport's named after him. Next time you're there, you can say, did you know this is named after a signaller in the Gallipoli campaign? I said we're fortunate to have quite a few memoirs of signalers, and here's just three um, that are worth digging out. I, I particularly like Shrapnel and Semaphore as well by a New Zealander because I'm going to read a few uh, extracts now as we come towards the close uh, because I think the best way to talk about what it would be like as a signaler is take it directly from the men who are involved. I mentioned Sam Sutcliffe earlier in the 1st Essex Regiment. I've got a little anecdote of him which I thought was quite amusing. He said... As a signaller, I had to move around constantly. I had no choice. When our comrades built and occupied new trench work, works, we had to run out lines and man the instruments to maintain communications from battalions to company and company to platoon. 50 yards or so from one end of, of our original collection of shell holes, where I still lodged from time to time, there was a clump of trees and bushes. And one morning, I was amazed to hear a voice coming from it saying, divine, so divine, the bearer of that, uh, of that name I knew to be an officer's servant, and the voice belonged to Lieutenant uh, Chalk, the battalion dandy. 
crawling past snipers to get to have a view, I came across Lieutenant Chalk gently sitting naked in a hip bath and fortunately unaware of my presence. Apparently, although the snipers were a damn nuisance to him, it was not going to describe the, uh, deprive this P.G. Woodhouse character from his mauling gold tub. And as requested, before long, Divine uh, turned up with fresh water. Also, fortunately for both of them, the Turk had decided not to shoot at the lieutenant and he decided afterwards never to bathe there again. Um, so imagine that, going around the corner, and there you've got an officer naked having a bath in the middle of nowhere, uh, and the, the Turk is just so amazed, doesn't shoot back at him. Um, but he also goes on to describe what would have been uh, probably, in fact, I've got a picture of him, I think there he is, Sam Sutcliffe, um, went on to the sleep deprivation that all signalers suffered. He said, we never had a satisfactory sleep, so we experimented with two on, two off, eight on, eight off, every arithmetical uh, combination we could think of to cover a 24-hour period. Nothing really worked. When you took over whatever interval your mate released from the crampy corner of the hole we lived and worked in should have felt free for some hours of beautiful sleep. But was he? On duty, you must want to go to the toilet at some time so your mate had to wake you up again and you had to take over. During the day, you often needed nourishment. So your mate who was off duty had to procure it and often cook it on small meth heaters. Actually, we catnapped all day and all night and just made the best of what was a very, very terrible existence. Resulting fatigue along with a poor diet was reducing us to shadows of ourselves. They sent our rations up to us every two or three days. As before, our staples remained plain hard biscuits, apricot jam, and tea boiled on our methylated spirit eaters. Corned beef was the only meat supplied with any regularity, though occasionally a few rashes of bacon came our way. Just look again at that food list and imagine yourself trying to live under such conditions and maintain your intelligence or even your sanity. So a lot of it was just pure sort of mind-numbing frustration and, and exhaustion. Here's that signal. What a beautiful photograph that is, isn't it? This is Bill Ledley of the Canterbury Signal Section. And he writes that, um, uh, uh, the uh, semaphores and, and, and signalling. And he talks about the opening day when he lands. He said, it was my job to see that all the signalling gear was taken ashore, including eight heliographs, eight Begbie lamps, two bicycles, and numerous other items such as flags, telescopes, and field glasses. When we were about a dozen yards from the beach, the barges grounded, and we were ordered to jump in the water and wade ashore as quickly as possible, as by this time we were under fairly heavy shrapnel fire. I was the last to leave my barge, and I was responsible for the signalling gear getting off. This meant supervising two or three tra trips backwards and forwards for some of the men. When I jumped into the water, it came up to my neck. I held my rifle above my head and waded towards the shore. But halfway there, I stumbled into a hole on the sea bottom and went right underneath the water. When I came up a few minutes later, I realised I was the only survivor of my group from the barge. I'd lost my rifle, but I soon managed to scramble out of the hole and reach the beach safely, and I quickly obtained a rifle from a dead Australian and joined up with the rest of the signalers, what were left of them, who'd gone on ahead. The Turks were now quietly shelling the beach, and we had to take cover under some rocks where our headquarters remained till late afternoon. By this time, hundreds of dead and wounded men were lying about, and then we received that our Colonel Stewart and Major Grant, our only two signals officers, had both been killed. So within the first hours of landing, he's lost everyone. A few months later, we'll just pick him up, and it's, uh, this is quite desperate, this bit. It's August the 11th, and he's on Chanot Bear Ridge, and it says, my birthday, and what a birthday it has been. I've not had a wash or a shave for over a week, and I'm feeling very creepy. The Turks are still holding us up, but we're to have another go at them tonight. Jock Mann returned from hospital in Alex yesterday, and he and I were sitting on the parapet of our trench the afternoon, this afternoon having a cup of tea. He was giving me an account of his experiences in Alex when a Turkish sniper bullet whizzed by within an inch of my ear. The next moment I saw a red spot appear on Jock's forehead. He fell forward into my arms, shot through the brain. We got him down to the dressing station as quickly as possible, but he was dead when we got there. The Turks have been shilling our trenches heavily all day, so we have to lie low. Wells, who is a good telegraphist, was hit by a piece of shrapnel and taken away to hospital. He got the shrapnel through his knee. I got a piece of my left arm, but it wasn't serious enough to go down, so I just put iodine on it and bound it up with a field dressing. 
We've only got five signalers left now in the brigade out of the original 18 who landed together. And our sergeant major has been put in charge of an infantry platoon, so it's all down to me for communications. A few days ago, a trawler with 150 bags of mail for us aboard capsized and sunk between here and Imbros, so I expect some of my letters and presents would have gone to the bottom of the sea. That must really do you for hours, isn't it? See the mail go down. Yeah. Now, we can always rely on a, an Aussie to give us a more sort of uplifting story, of course, can't we? Um, this is uh, Harold Hinkfuss uh, that wrote uh, um, Gallipoli Singler. Another really good account is in the 26th Battalion. This is actually his section, and I think he's on this row. That's him there, I'm pretty certain, uh, in the book. Uh, he talks initially about some of the antiquated kit they use. He says, my first job was at Taylor's Hollow to set up a switchboard. It was an antique, probably used in the Saddam War. He had a crossbar made of brass. The first edition of Paul's Telephony shows it as the first piece of apparatus made after the telephone was invented by Graham Bell in 1873. The field telephone consisted of three separate parts, a lever strap, which held the earpiece, the transmitter, which had to be held in the hand, and a box containing the rest of the apparatus. It was torture to have the earpiece strapped onto your head, as the earth induction from the other stations was a constant buzz. In particular, the call sign ESST from Suvla Bay interfered continually with our signals at Anzac. Our signaling lamp was almost very, also very primitive. It consisted of a square cast iron box fitted with shutters and operated by pushing and pulling a rod at the top with an oil lamp inside. This is low tech signaling. Percy Crooney there is, uh, um, was also with the first Essex. I think he does a very good account of what it was like to be a signaller. I've just got one more, am I right for time? A couple of minutes, yeah? Still on good? Okay. I just wanted to mention this one from Harold because it's a lovely story. It says, uh, our password for our station was Wollongabba. About 12.30 a.m. an officer came round, Major Foster, the night officer on duty. What a lovely, nice elderly fellow. After Whitty had told him the situation was quiet and there'd been no movement or messages, he sat down and told us it was his birthday and that he'd received a parcel from a naval vessel. It consisted of two roast chickens, one cake and a bottle of wine. We wished him a happy birthday and he departed. It was cold and we were hungry and tired. Whitty asked Harry if I could hold the position for a while and away he went. We thought he was going to the latrine, but lo and behold, he was back in half an hour with a chicken under his arm. He clawed it, we clawed it all to pieces. He gave me a leg and a thigh and the same to Harry. And we chucked the bones over the side of the parapet. About half an hour before stand two, the Major arrived back again. After Whitty had told him all that was well, we sat down on the fire step. Harry asked him if he had a, bit, had a nice party. He said, yes, was the reply. It was very nice, but somehow or another, one of my chickens disappeared. <laughs> I asked him, I suppose you would charge the man if you found out who took that chicken. He said, no, I'd promote the bugger to corporal. I had all of my battalion scouts guard in that package. <laughs> <laughs> Initiative is key to signalling, and you don't want to get hungry either. So you recognise that, no doubt, those of you that have been, this is sort of Chocolate Hill, as it would have looked uh, in the distance. Very different to how we see it today, right, on the base of it. And this is where Percy Crooney first arrives. He was with the First Essex, attached them, um, and sent up as a signaller. And he describes this, this area perfectly. He says, the trench dies away at the rocky foot of Chocolate Hill, about 50 yards to the left of my old post. An Essex nuller is the gully running up its side. Besides manning 100 yards or so of trench running away the valley, Y Company also holds the forward edge of Essex Nuller, through which a woefully thin, they have a woefully thin line of men. I proceed up to the bottom of the Nuller, slowly taking in the position of the post and the general lie of the land, for a signaller's job does not end with a tapper. He is also the runner who carries his messages when received. I spy a bivvy near the top of the rear side of the Nuller. It seems a funny place to put it. Johnny Turk can see it quite clearly from there, no one else is about, so that must be the signals. So I climb up towards it and I come and stand outside. A great slab of rock forms almost a level floor for the bivik, bivouac, and another on the right of the skyline constitutes a wall to one side with a couple of ground sheets which were built up uh, to assist the position. This end faced down the nuller of the bivy and formed, was out into the open. The sun shines brightly and some moments pass 
before dropping on my hands and knees, my eyes pierce the gloom beneath the ground sheets and I see a man sitting at the far end. Soldier Halliday? Yep, me, the voice in says side. Crony here, reporting for duty. Come in. And I crawl in and sit beside him. What can you do? The lot, I hope, soldier. Mend lines, breaks in the line. When they're found. All right, take over. And I'm buckling the earpiece from his head. He passes it to my hands, strapping around my own head. I ask, where's the others? What others? Company signals, of course. We are the signals, you and me. Oh, how do we manage things then? Two on two off, day and night, week after week, till one of us dies. <laughs> There's such a depth of despondency in his voice that my eyes, now turned to the dim light behind the ground sheet, search his face. If ever a man was really sick, he is this soldier. His tired, drawn, sallow face and yellow eyes almost shout the words, Yellow Jack. Of course, he should be in hospital, but won't say nothing. I've learnt that regular soldiers, are though, although they may silently long for a bullet or a shell splinter to get them away, would sooner die than report sick with an ordinary illness. It's quite telling that, isn't it? Now we are coming towards a conclusion and I have alluded to the fact that I think signalers are quite bright and Dudley, I think, you know, as a Royal Military Policeman, you'll back me up in this, that signalers with a certain level of intellect, yeah? <laughs> Very few regiments of Gallipoli Peninsula uh, can uh, claim this chap, for instance. Um, you probably, some of you might recognise him. Uh, he was a Royal Engineer signaler by the name of Second Lieutenant Henry Mosley. And from the, the Royal Corps Signals for our centenary, um, just published a new history, and I'll just read what they said about him. Mosley was a brilliant scientist who in 1915 was nominated for Nobel Prizes in both physics and chemistry. His work using X-ray spectroscopy demonstrated the physical basis for the atomic numbers and made sense of the periodic table. Soon after the war broke out, Mosley enlisted in Kitchener's army as a signals officer with the Royal Engineers Signal Service. He landed as Brigade Signals Officer at Anzac Cove and on August the 5th, 5th, 1915, was killed while sending a telephone report um, to divisional headquarters during a Turkish counterattack at the Battle of Sari Bar. Five days li later, Isaac Asimov wrote, in view of what Mosley might still have accomplished, his death might well have been the most costly single death of the war to mankind generally. Uh, so, I mean, to have someone who actually added to the periodic table, I think is pretty, you, yeah. So if there's a pub quiz, get near a signal is the answer. Um, and we come to this, uh, signaler's peril you know, depicts what it would have been like changing wire, obviously that's not Gallipoli. There's no real memorial to signalers uh, at Gallipoli as such. Um, but what I would draw your attention to is the work of Charles Sergeant Jagger. Uh, and what you see on the left there is just one of two panels that Jagger put at the Louvre Corps Memorial uh, in, uh, just outside Combray. This is the Commonwealth War Graves Commission at their best. These are not just normal bits of carving on a memorial. These are pieces of art that should be in museums, but thankfully aren't. And this is the signaller phase of it because on one side he looks at uh, medical getting them away the other side he looks at signaling and you can see that guy if you look he's got his headset there over there he's using the telescope to look over the top uh, he's gripping his rifle because he's going to need it but there th there's his morse key just at the bottom there equally important is heat food and tools to dig and if you look at the infantry just going over the top the thing I love about this is just the way the officer has obviously been hit and he's just letting go of that Webley revolver, you know. On the other one, where it's got a medical guy being whisked away on a stretcher, the guy's grabbing the stretcher so tightly that he's even carved a muscle in the hand that is only visible when you grab something tightly. That's attention to detail. So Charles Sergeant Yager served in the Gallipoli campaign. I think he was awarded a military cross, actually, for his action with the Lincolnshire Regiment. But he did this magnificent, uh, it makes me proud whenever I go here, and it means whenever we go there, whoever's with me is going to listen to signalling for about half an hour. Um, so what was the answer? Because we talked about waving those flags. Well, one signaller gave me this, and the idea was I was going to bring my Royal Naval Division Lee Enfield rifle that was used in Gallipoli with my Hook William bayonet that's apparently more valuable than the rifle. Um, but... Uh, 
Yeah, as we know, the RF are risk averse as opposed to risk aware, Tom. So we don't have rifles in here. <laughs> joking. <laughs> I'm joking. Um, but this is what uh, I was given. So this little black thing here fits over a bayonet of a rifle. And then the whole thing stretches to make it quite taut. And if I was to hold that up towards the Turkish, you can't see much really, can you? It's other than it's dated 1918. But if you were to look on the other side, and I'll try and hold it up, it's not quite so easy. That is the most incredible piece of low-tech signaling kit that I've seen. And, and I've used this um, over a kilometre. We took this to Gallipoli to try it with uh, Frank Tugard, who's a signaler that you'll know, Dudley. And from the edge of 12 Tree Cop Cemetery, and he was across by the cafe on the other Crofia Road, I sent a message, and we didn't say what it was. And then when I got to him, there was a cool FS waiting. So he'd read the message perfectly. So low tech can work sometimes if it's common sense. And uh, that's the story as best I can on signaling at Gallipoli. So any questions? <laughs>